Dr. Angster. Hello. 30 Two seconds. seconds. I guess uh, when I see the change here, that means we're on. Good morning. Um, we are here at West Liberty University and we're very fortunate to have uh, Jennifer Higdon with us uh, for today's webinar. I'd like to welcome everyone viewing online and our studio audience. Um, just a quick word about uh, some sponsorship here. Um, Jennifer is visiting with us today courtesy of the West Virginia Division of Culture and History, Judge and Mrs. Frederick P. Stamp, Jr and the Women's Philharmonic Advocacy, uh, in addition to West Liberty University, bringing this to you today. So, uh, good morning. Good Jennifer. morning, Welcome. good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just a couple of words about uh, Jennifer Higdon, um, Grammy Award, Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> That's really all I need to say. <laughs> um, but uh, she is having a work uh, being performed by the Wheeling Symphony on Friday evening. And she's here in town to do some outreach and, uh, and things like that. So we are very pleased to have her here. Um, first, we'll start off with, uh, could you tell us about what you are doing with the symphony or what the symphony is doing on Friday? Well, they're performing my concerto for orchestra, uh, which is a, it's a pretty sizable piece. It's designed to show off the orchestra, the individual soloists, the sections, and uh, the, the entire group in general. It was commissioned by the Philadelphia Orchestra back in 2002. Uh, it was a premiere that changed my life. Composers don't often get this as an overnight experience, but uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra made the decision at some point right before it was premiered that they were going to schedule it during the League of American Orchestras conference. And what that is, it's a gathering that happens every year, usually in June, of orchestra managers. Uh, so my audience was made up of 3,000 orchestra managers from across the United States, a few from other countries. That's a good audience. Yeah, it's a great audience, but it is a scary audience, I have to be <laughs> honest. I realized that my entire life was gonna come down to that 35 minutes, because if it didn't go well, if the piece didn't work, that would be the end of my composing oh, career. Wow, so, yeah. But uh, fortunately, it went well. Uh, it was kind of an amazing experience and a little unnerving. But the piece is, is a great way to show off really the orchestra here. It, this is a perfect way to right, right. come and hear the individual players and hear the sections and it's kind of fun. A concerto for orchestra is different than a regular concerto. Right, I was going to ask that. Yeah, how is it different? Yeah, regular concerto features somebody at the front. The front of mm -hmm. the hall in front of the orchestra and it usually shows off that instrument. It shows off what that instrument can do and that soloist, how they, they handle everything from slow music to fast music. Uh, but in this case, it's a chance to show off the entire group. Mm -hmm. So you get a chance to hear the winds, you get a chance to hear the brass, the strings, there are lots of solos, all the principal players have solos. There is even a movement for the percussion. And in joining the percussion, we have the piano and the celesta and the harp. And I think this actually may be the first instance where there's an entire movement dedicated to the percussion. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's an interesting thing to try to do and I'm grateful that it worked. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're all excited to hear it. Um, I have some questions here that were submitted um, by some of our students and students around the state. Um, so we can just go ahead and get started with those. Sounds and good. The first one is um, kind of the most basic question that you would most likely see coming is how did you get started as a composer? I was a very late starter on flute. I taught myself to play. Uh, I joined the band in high school, the marching band. Marching band was very big in my high school. This was in East Tennessee. We were a competition band and it was so much fun marching in that band. Now, I did two things in the band. I actually played flute and piccolo, but at, at one point I also played percussion because we, because we were a competition band. We were moved around to fill slots because you don't want to have gaps in the line if you're going to competitions. But I found the experience so thrilling. I mean, if you've ever been in a marching band, you know what it's like to step into a stadium and have the stadium kind of roar for you. It's a, it's a fairly addictive thing. <laughs> so, but I, it struck me when I was in band that 
music's a pretty powerful agent. And I decided uh, at that point that I wanted to major in music. But what I didn't know was I didn't really know anything about music at that point. And uh, when I decided to major in music, it's probably good I didn't realize how much I didn't know. Because I went off not really knowing classical literature. I knew some flute pieces. I knew the pieces we had done in the marching band. We had concert band and off season, but we didn't do anything out of the ordinary. Uh, but when I went off to school, it was kind of opening a whole new world for me. Uh, and I realized I was in the right place and I had to really work to kind of catch up with my classmates. But I was so thrilled with the opportunity to, to do that that I just kind of dug in, put my head down and started working. Mm -hmm. And so even now, it, for me, composing is a sense of discovery. It still is. I'm still learning the repertoire. Um, but it's thrilled because it, it never gets boring. There's always something to learn. Right, right. Uh, regarding uh, these questions that I'm going to be asking, if anyone in the audience would like to think of a question during this, uh, we can certainly take those. We have a microphone over here uh, for you to come up. Um, I'll put Anthony on the spot since he um, did submit a question to us before, so not right now, but maybe I might be calling on you later. Um, and that goes for everyone who's viewing online as well. If you wanted to submit a question via the Ustream social stream or the chat, um, I should be able to see that here on my computer. So if you wanted to submit that, maybe that'll be one of the questions that we get to. So. I'll also try to answer on behalf of all composers in history. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's, right. it's a big order, but I'll do it. I'll stand in for everybody. Very good, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, well, you've talked a little bit about this next question already. Um, what was the one experience that convinced you to pursue composition slash music? I guess you talked about music in general. Right. Um, but uh, being a composer, what was that? What was the first uh, kind of experience there? Oh, or? yeah. That's a, because I, when I entered college, I was a performance major. I was a flute. Okay. And somehow it didn't occur to me to be a composition major. Maybe I just didn't know enough about music to realize. But I had this fantastic flute teacher. This is kind of an example of how one excellent teacher can make such a difference. My flute teacher is Judith Bentley. This was at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. She could teach not only flute, but she taught music and like life lessons. And I came in during my sophomore year, I came into a lesson one day and it was a typical lesson. I brought in some music and my teacher said, oh, we've got, uh, we've got another, we've got a flute player, composer coming in, Harvey Solberger. And instead of having you play a piece like I'm going to have everyone else do, I would like for you to write something. And I actually said, well, how do you do that? I literally just didn't have any idea hmm. how to <laughs> proceed with this. So she showed me how to do a six-tone row, not a 12-tone row, but a six-tone row. Now, I don't know if that's because maybe <laughs> she didn't think I could handle all 12 tones. I don't know. <laughs> I should actually ask her about that, but <laughs> it's striking now that I know what I know. I thought, hmm, six tones. And the reality is, I, I only wrote a piece for a flute and piano. It was only a two minute piece. The piece was called Night Creatures. And uh, looking back on it, the piano only played one note. It's kind of a little ostinato. But that experience was so amazing for me. It was such a revelation of, you can write the notes down and you can hear it played back and even if you're not the one playing it, there's still something kind of magical about it. So it started with that. And f from that point on, my teacher said, well, you know, why don't you write something for the flute choir? You know, I heard the saxophone studio, which was next door. There's someone there who would like a saxophone and horn piece. Why don't you do that? She encouraged me. And that's, that's the thing. I kind of marvel at a really superb teacher that can kind of sense something within the student and draw that out. Uh, I finished when I was in Bowling Green, I finished my degree in performance. I actually stuck with the flute, but it was obvious as I was going on through my schooling that composition was kind of taking up more and more of my time. And so by the time I was ready to graduate, I had to decide, you know, was it going to be flute or was it going to be composition? So I ended up applying to a couple of different schools in composition and I got into Curtis. So, so at that point I kind of made a, a changeover in my study focus. Um, but the truth is, even at that point, because I had started so late, I was still playing catch up. The theory classes, the solfege, the basic piano, all of that, all of that was part of the education. And it was, I kept playing flute, but I did it more for the fun of it. It was a different sort of setup, but the exploring the scores, learning the repertoire, figuring out what I needed to do to get the notes on the page to make sense for a performer, 
It's been a fantastic journey. I'm sometimes startled when I think about the fact that I really, when I went to college, I knew absolutely nothing. I mean, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I knew like three or four flute pieces. That was about the extent of it. Wow, wow. Okay. Um, jumping ahead um, from the beginning of your career now to where you are, um, and the, w with the performance of your piece this Friday by the Wheeling Symphony Orchestra, which I don't know if I mentioned them at the beginning. <laughs> Wheeling Symphony Orchestra uh, is going to be uh, performing her concerto for orchestra, and they're one of our sponsors for this event as well. Um, but can you talk a little bit about um, what it is like working with um, a major symphony orchestra? You talked a little bit about Philadelphia and, and of course, the Wheeling Symphony, and just what is that all it's a, you know, it's, it's kind of an amazing experience. I, I always think it's totally overwhelming. It was, when we did this concerto for orchestra, the first performances with uh, Philadelphia Orchestra, I have to admit it was such an adrenaline-inducing experience that I don't remember a lot of the week. I think I was like really exhausted and kind of in shock. We went in to the Kimmel Center. It's a brand new hall in Philadelphia. And they, they put me in the middle of the audience, which is, it's basically empty. It's just a lot of seats. And suddenly you hear these notes that you've labored over for quite some time coming out of the orchestra. But what's interesting is for a composer, and this is important to, to remember if you write music, when it's first done, when there's first rehearsals, it never sounds like you think it's going to. There's no way that it can because the musicians are learning the music. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Who's doing what when? Is someone supposed to be playing with them? Are they supposed to be playing with someone? And so it sounded to me at first like kind of a cacophony of sound coming from the stage. It was amazing because it was the Philadelphia Orchestra and, and you can't live in Philadelphia without being aware of the legacy of that symphony. But it also, I could not somehow comprehend that the sounds were going to kind of mesh into what I had written on the page. But over the next couple of days, because normally what happens, you go in um, a couple of days before the premiere and you might have a one hour rehearsal, maybe 45 minutes that they have allotted for your piece. They've allotted other time for another piece on the program. And in this case, it was Strauss uh, Ein Heldenleben was the other piece on the program, big piece. Uh, so we had, my first rehearsal was only 45 minutes. It's a 35 minute piece. They didn't rehearse the whole thing. But I wasn't even sure when we came out of the first rehearsal if it worked. And I don't know if that was from the amount of adrenaline in my system or was it the orchestra learning the music. This is brand new music and it's actually a pretty difficult piece. Uh, it's audience friendly, but there are a lot of layers and there's a lot of stuff going on. So as the days went on, as we got closer and closer to premiere, it started to sound closer to what I, I thought it probably would sound like. But one of the things I've learned as someone who writes music for performers, you have to make sure that you're, you're, you get everything down on the page to help the performer learn the music. It's, it's really imperative and that is especially true if you're doing something with an orchestra because you may not have a lot of rehearsal time. Mm -hmm. By the time we got to the premiere, I was so nervous that I didn't sit out in the audience. I thought I might have a heart attack and just die <laughs> from the excitement and the nerves. So the orchestra allowed me to sit backstage. They actually allowed me to sit back there. And it's kind of funny what happens when you feel like you're going to die. And this is, the, this is the ultimate in nerves. This is a major premiere. And I realized the entire audience, first of all, being all orchestra managers, I realized everything was kind of riding on these 35 minutes. But the other thing was I was completely unknown. So th I'm sh I was thinking to myself, well, people probably, I was the first half, Strauss was the second half. Perhaps people are like having coffee and staying longer at their dinner, you know, or are they going to want to hear this piece? <laughs> but I didn't know because I was actually sitting backstage. What happens backstage at an orchestra concert is there are a lot of people standing back there as soon as the music starts. Once the conductor walks out on the stage, everybody disperses. They go off. They've got stopwatches. They know when to come back, when the end of the piece is. So then I was alone backstage, and I swear to you, my entire life was passing in front of my eyes. <laughs> I thought, well, it was a good run, you know, and, and I actually was sitting there <laughs> pondering to myself. I thought, well, geez, you know, it was like 20 years ago that I actually had my, that first basic theory class, the remedial class I had at Bowling Green. I was literally having one of those moments. Well, yeah, I had the remedial theory and maybe I could have done better. I'm having this entire discussion to calm myself down. <laughs> so what happens is you hear the music coming from the stage, but it sounds kind of warped because you're standing at the back of the violins. Mm -hmm. You don't really truly hear what's going on. But it finally ended and I kept thinking, wow, that was fast because I'm sure time was moving pretty mm -hmm. quickly for me. And I could hear the audience applauding and people regathered backstage because the conductor was coming off. Someone came back there with a towel for the conductor and someone had some water and he came off the stage and <laughs> 
this is kind of amazing. I, he motioned to me like, you're going to walk out with me. And I thought to myself, I'm going to walk out there. I don't know why I didn't think of this. But <laughs> he took me out onto the stage and the entire audience got up on his feet. It was, it was such a shocking experience that I have to admit, a picture showed up on the front of the page, paper the next day on the front of Philadelphia Inquirer. <laughs> I looked pretty in shock. First of all, it looked like there was no blood in my face. <laughs> looked like it had all been drained out. But uh, I was so amazed by the reaction of the piece. And I learned an important lesson that day. The fact that no one knew who I was, which is true, no one knew who the heck I was, worked to my advantage because their expectation was fairly low. And so when the piece came off well and they really liked it, it meant that they were kind of blown away. They were like, well, how did we not know this composer. So not being known, having kind of a late start, turned out to work in my favor. But my life changed overnight, literally. The next day, my phone started ringing with commission offers and people scheduling this piece, which is unusual for a, a new orchestra work, especially a 35-minute orchestra work. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I realized I was going to have to cut down on my teaching. I started getting invited to go to places where there were performances going on. And so it was overwhelming but I'm often reminded when I talk to composers anyone who writes anything it's it's unnerving even if you write something for solo cello or solo piano and if you're doing theory you're doing composition you have to kind of take a deep breath you have to sit back and let the process happen let the performers learn the music because it's not going to sound the way you thought and giving them that room has been for me it was it was an incredible an incredible lesson it's one I keep in mind now because whenever I take a new work to an orchestra it's always unnerving. You, you want it to work. You don't know if the issues you're hearing from the stage are because you need to fix something in the music or is it they're just learning the music. So over time, you just you kind of develop a sixth sense, but it takes time to develop that sixth sense. Uh, but it isn't easy. I think often being the person who writes the notes and puts it out there, it's a little bit of your heart and soul on the line. And it is scary. I mean, I have admiration. I'm always amazed by people who can go up on stage and perform. Because I spend 99% of my time in a studio alone with my cat, Bo, <laughs> who was on the prompter, actually, when we came in. But I spend so much time alone doing this stuff that when I have to come out and face an audience, I'm a little overwhelmed by the experience. I'm like, oh, there's people here. Who let them into my studio? <laughs> so, but it's, you know what? It's sharing music, and that's the best thing you can do. You mentioned um, that your concerto is audience-friendly. Right. Would you... Expand on Yeah, that. absolutely. Uh, I've always been a big believer that the music should communicate. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably have come to this conclusion after, as a student, attending a lot of concerts where there were times where a, a piece came on that I just, it wasn't speaking to me. And I would think about five million other things, like the term paper I needed to do, or, oh, I need to go practice my solfege lesson, or I owe someone chord progressions in a theory class. But I've always noticed that even with standard repertoire, the one thing we can say about standard repertoire or new works that we like is, and even this goes for pop music too, the music holds your attention. That's the whole idea is the music has to hold your attention. That's how pieces that are famous become famous. They've held somebody's attention and usually a lot of people's. So that realization made me think about communication in music. So I noticed, maybe because I didn't grow up around classical music, because we had pop music in the house. My father was a commercial artist and he always had music playing on in the house when he was writing, when he was doing his illustrations, when he was creating whatever it was he had to, to do, whatever his job was. But because I grew up on much more pop music, my sensibility is that I, I tend to need a pulse, some sort of recognizable pulse. I like to know where I am in a piece and I think about that when I'm composing. I think about the fact that I want the music to make the most sense for the listener. And so my job as a composer is to make sure that from the very first note that you write to the end that I'm holding your attention. So as I'm writing, I'm constantly asking myself, is this little phrase interesting enough? Is there something I can do to make it more interesting? Do I need to change the instruments? Do I need to change the color, the octave? Do I need to change the key? And I think about the things that feel to me like they communicate, which may be different for any other person creating any kind of work of art. But I think about it constantly because I figure if the music's not communicating, it's not going to do its job. So when you design a piece, when I'm designing, I think about who I'm writing for. I think about what they sound good doing. With a concerto for orchestra, 
because it was written for the Philadelphia Orchestra, people mention all the time the Philadelphia string sound. And that kind of gave me the idea right off the bat that maybe I should do one movement about the strings, just the strings, just feature them. And then I started getting these requests from the players in the Philly Orchestra. I found out about the commission in 1998, and it was premiered in 2002. It was a four-year gap. Uh, but this was interesting. The, some of the musicians in the Philly Orchestra, I would encounter them on the street when I was walking around, and they would, they would ask for something with solos. They would ask for a solo. When you write my solo, would you do this? So I made a list of the requests, and so the whole third movement's based on those requests. I thought, well, I can't leave out this person. They didn't say anything to me about a solo, but if I'm writing a solo for the concertmaster and the principal viola and the cello, shouldn't I write one for the principal second? So second violin doesn't normally get a solo, but why not include them? I knew the second violin. I'd gone to school with her. So, but that, those sorts of things, observing what the performers want, kind of determines what I put in a piece. So I designed the piece in a way to kind of reflect the requests, but also you want to make whoever you're writing for sound good. You have to know the instruments, you have to kind of be aware of what they can do or what they want. And they'll often, if you ask a performer, they'll, they'll tell you what they want. It's, a, it's an interesting process. I have to admit it's a bit mysterious though. I sometimes wonder where the musical ideas come from. I find that, <laughs> I find that a little mysterious, but I'm, I'm always digging to try to get to that answer to figure that out. Okay. Uh, I have another question here. Um, who is one of your favorite composers or <laughs> some of your favorite composers right. and what is it about their music? Okay, so you're ready for this answer. It's Lennon and McCartney. All right. It's the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> I think because I grew up listening so much of the Beatles, I have no doubt, even though you probably couldn't find any kind of literal quotation in my music, there's something about their music and the, the way they combine sounds and their sense of rhythm and pulse and the way their songs tell stories that I am sure is ingrained in my brain. I think the year that the, uh, was it the Sgt. Pepper's album came out? Mm. I'm, I must have listened to that album once every day for like a solid year. I'm sure it drove my parents uh, crazy a little bit, but uh, I have no doubt that that probably has affected my sense of writing. Uh, having not grown up on classical music too, I think my sensibility about the things I like is probably a little more skewed than a lot of other people. But if I, if I thought about the first classical music I encountered, it actually was contemporary music. It wasn't, it wasn't standard repertoire. So I remember at one point hearing Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring. And I heard it was playing somewhere in the background somewhere, and I, I didn't know what the piece was. I, I came in in the middle of the piece. And at, at the time I was living at the base of the Smoky Mountains, I was living in an Appalachian area. And when I heard it, I actually stopped, and I thought, wow, that sounds like the mountains. I, I actually thought that. And then they did a back announcement at the end of the, the piece. They said, oh, it's Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring. I'm like, oh, I never heard of this Aaron Copeland guy, you know. Uh, <laughs> but the... The Appalachian Spring made sense. I had literally thought about that, and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So I went out and got the, the record. This is when they had records. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I went out and those. got the, yeah. the, the album and, and took a listen to it, and I was like, oh, that sounds like the mountains. And I was absolutely sure that Aaron Copeland had intended it to sound like the mountains. I really did. But then I realized later on when I started studying the work, and then I had to teach about it, I was like, oh, Aaron Copeland wasn't thinking about the mountains at all, apparently. This was, that title was originally Dance for Martha. It was not mm -hmm. actually Appalachian Spring, and it, it really struck me that I had taken that away. But that also kind of told me, I'm like, oh, that's interesting, that means, Maybe if you're thinking about something when you're writing, if you've got something in mind, an emotion or a feeling or a story, you, it may come across. He may have been thinking that, I don't know. Hmm. But because my first experiences with classical music were the newer pieces, Aaron Copeland, Samuel Barber, I love, I probably tend towards the, what would be known as the American school, but I'm also really fond of uh, Debussy and Ravel, the French school. But to be honest, I think influence comes from absolutely everywhere, and I think it's also the things that I just run across when I'm standing out waiting. <laughs> if I'm on a subway platform in New York and someone's playing music on an instrument, there's someone down there busking, I think I pick up the influence of that. I listen to a lot of country western. Sometimes I will listen to rap music. I mean, I, I listen to everything. I try to pull influences from everywhere, but I just find it interesting when you think about it, rap music, classical country, rock and roll, Lady Gaga, I mean it doesn't matter who it is, it's all the same thing. Someone wrote the notes, someone wrote the words, 
and they all do the same thing they communicate and that kind of that realization that it's all actually connected was a little bit of a revelation because when you get into school you're thinking so much about your assignments which you have to take care of you know you got to practice so many hours doing this and you got to work on your theory you got to work on I always because I was taking remedial classes I always had like a list of things I had to get through every day which I really needed that repetition to get to where I needed to go to learn but you get so focused on that that you often don't realize, oh, the music, you, you forget what inspired you in the first place. So I had had these moments where I'd think about the marching band, the experience of walking in the stadium and what that was like. So when I was writing the concerto for orchestra, I'll let you in on a little secret here. The percussion movement ends, it has drums really going to town. They're really going to town. That's from my marching band days. I thought, remember that sound, the drum cadences as we were marching in the stadium, as you went in through the stadium, the big con concrete, it's where all the football players go from the locker room area out into the stadium. The drums make an amazing sort of sound. And so I thought, when I was writing the concerto for orchestra, this will probably be the last orchestra piece I'm ever allowed to write, and so I should just put everything in it that I can. <laughs> and so as a consequence, I thought, well, let's put, in the, let's put in that marching band experience. I'm going to have the drums interacting just like they used to hear them do when they were doing the cadences as you were going into the stadium. So it shows how influence pops up absolutely, absolutely everywhere. But uh, it's, it, it makes it fun. I have to admit that being able to put that in a classical piece, I thought, well, what's this going to be like? I've got my high school marching band days coming from the Philadelphia Orchestra stage should be very interesting. But fortunately for me, drummers are always cool trying everything, so they were totally into it. <laughs> All right, I actually have a question here that came in on the uh, social stream here. Uh, and it is, what advice would you give to young composers? Ah, that's a good question. It's a big question and it's, it's a superb question, but it's actually one that it needs a good answer. Uh, the first thing I would say is listen to as much music as you possibly can. Uh, if you can, like if you're in a school and there's a library, listen with a CD and listen with a score in your hand because that kind of teaches you how instruments react to each other. If you don't like a score, figure out why you don't like the score. Why do you not like this kind of music? Um, or is there something this composer is doing that you don't particularly care for? If you can articulate that, you can learn from it. The pieces you like, try to figure out why you like them. Uh, experiencing as much music as you can is, I think, a fantastic rule of thumb. The other thing, and this is a really major thing, write as much as you possibly can. And uh, in addition, write for people that you know who might be able to play the pieces for you. Because the writing and then handing it off to someone and hearing what that's going to do teaches you an incredible amount of information. In fact, I'm often amazed when I sit in the audience listening to one of my pieces, like the Concerto for Orchestra, which has been done a lot, I'm still learning as I go. I still am going, oh, you know, that didn't quite work the way I thought it was going to. Maybe I could have balanced the instruments. But the key is actually, I think, studying scores and writing as much as you possibly can. When you write, though, and my advice always to young composers is to write for people you know who can play the pieces for you. And it's because you need to hear the pieces. It's hard. Now we have the computer programs, Finale, Sibelius. You can get playback, but MIDI playback is just an approximation, and it's not always accurate to what a performer can do. We forget sometimes that the wind player has to breathe. That's often a, a, a sin we commit, or we don't realize it sounds great when it's up really high on an instrument, but may not sound that way when it's being executed. Uh, you don't want to injure players, so it's better to actually try it out with performers. And that sometimes that when you're in school, that can be a little frustrating because you think, oh, well, the players aren't as good as my MIDI plays it back. Fantastic. But the fact that you sit down with a performer and let them play through something, even if it's not for performance, maybe it's just they've looked at the piece and you've gotten together in a practice room, that sort of experience will tell you a lot. And I actually learn a lot from asking the performers, why doesn't this work for you? Is there something you would suggest I would do differently? Um, but writing and studying, those two things, it sounds very basic, but it actually, those are the things that will kind of move you forward in learning. It's a, it's a lifetime journey, though. But I have to admit, the composing and the, the learning about composing and the instruments is a lifetime journey. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question, though. That's a really good one. Uh, at this point, uh, maybe we can open it up to someone who's dying to ask a question from our studio audience. Uh, Anybody? 
<laughs> Anthony, I'm putting you on the spot. I know that you. Uh, you Do you want to go questions? to the so, microphone there? Yeah. Um, as a young composer, I kind of have difficulty um, with writer's block. Right. Um, so I would ask you, what's your process when you receive writer's block? That's a that's a big one because writer writer's block is actually it's a problem for a lot of people. It's amazing how much that is a struggle. In fact, I think anyone who creates anything, whether the written words or even painting, music, will experience writer's block at some point. I often tell my students that if they're going through this with a piece, that they should set a goal every day, even if they write for just 15 minutes, and tell themselves they have to write three or four measures. Now, the trick is not to judge those measures. It's to write absolutely anything that you can. That's the most important thing. You can go back the next day and look at those four measures and figure out if you want to get rid of them or do you want to adjust a few notes or the rhythm. But by forcing yourself to do that, it causes a piece to actually grow. And the thing to always remember, if you're having problems writing, you can write an entire piece. You have the right to delete it, throw it away, you're not committed to having that piece stay in the world. You have the right to get rid of it if you get stuck. Um, getting stuck is normal. It's figuring out how to get out of that hole that you're in. So forcing yourself to write a few notes or a few measures, if you can set like a little personal goal, even if you decide on Monday you're going to write four measures every day, and you do four on Monday, four on Tuesday, four on Wednesday, four on Thursday, and then on Friday you look at what you've come up with, you may look at it and say, oh, this is not very good, I'm going to start over, and you could delete all of that. Or you can keep it and figure out how to try to make it more interesting. Or you can say, oh, you know, this is not as bad as I thought. So it's like taking small steps instead of worrying about writing the whole thing. There's this thing called masterpiece syndrome that composers often have. They're like, oh, it's not as good as what Beethoven wrote. How am I going to do this? Lennon and McCartney, they wrote amazing stuff. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. You can't really look at it like that because those guys never thought of it that way. They never thought, I've got to write as good as Beethoven. Beethoven wouldn't have been thinking that. He was like, I've got to get this job done. I need to, I've got to get this done because I've got to pay the rent and I've got to like eat food, you know? So setting small goals for yourself is a really important thing. And just making yourself, it may be that you don't feel the music. You know, we like to sit down and think inspiration strikes like that. But the truth is, inspiration doesn't really strike like that. I write every day, every single day I write. And there are days where I write six or seven hours in a day. It's a considerable amount of writing. Because I do that regularly every day, though, I, I have fewer writer's block. It's trickier when you're in school because you're balancing classwork. You know, all the things you have to do, the piano practice you have to do, your saxophone practice. And so if you set aside just 15 minutes a day, it's a little easier to control it. But the writer's block actually will dissolve. I read something recently, and I thought this was fascinating. The people who hike up onto big mountains, like if they're going to summit on Everest or something, the Sherpas will start you out early, early in the morning, sometimes at 2 or 3 a.m. The reasoning behind this has something to do with the psychological impact of trying to climb a mountain where you can see the height, the summit. So they reason that if they actually start, they start the process, with the little lamps that they wear on their hats, if someone can actually just see the few steps in front of them in the dark, if they start at like midnight or 1 a.m., they won't see what they're trying to scale. They won't see it. They'll actually just see the few steps that are in front of them. And that's actually a pretty profound sort of thing because all you have to do is take one step, one step, one step. By the time the sun comes up, they're already at the summit, but they didn't see the steepness and how far they had to go to get there. The Sherpas say that if they start once the sun's up and people can see, the people almost never make it to the top. If they start them in the dark and they have a little headlamp, they're actually okay. They can do it. They can make the, they can make the summit. But it's the same way in composing. In fact, probably doing anything in life, everything that's ever been written, everything that the Beatles wrote, everything that Beethoven wrote, Everything that I write, everything that you write, anyone writes, it's one note at a time. It's the same rule for absolutely everyone. So just get some notes on the page. Even if you don't feel deeply about it, if you're not sure if it works, just get a few notes on the page. Come back to it the next day or a couple days later and figure out if you like those notes. Is there some small thing you can change? You won't feel inspired every time you sit down. It's not 
actually possible to do that. But if you kind of do it regularly every day for just a little bit, you'd be amazed. The, when you sit down every day, sometimes the inspiration will pop up. It's like the muse shows up. The muse knows that you're going to sit down and come up with something. So, but the thing is small steps. Bach, small steps, Mozart, one note at a time. No one ever writes more than one note at a time. It's the same for all of us. I so, write two or three notes at a time, actually. But do you really? <laughs> <laughs> that's, ladies and gentlemen, this is news. <laughs> Thank you. It was a good question. Yeah, very good yeah, question. Very good question. Um, are there others? Um, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. I'd follow up just, uh, you're talking about the compositional process yeah. here, and uh, you mentioned not too long ago the idea of, uh, of MIDI. I think I'm actually out of the camera view. Oh, no, that's, you are, you are, yeah, you are. So, the idea of, of composing now, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering how much of that you might do from the keyboard versus um, working, if, whether, whether you're scribing things out by hand on manuscript right. paper or, or immediately kind of going to the computer notation. Yeah listening back to some of that yeah. or how that how that works for you and I wonder if technology has changed the way you've done that just from the beginning of your career. Right. That's actually that's a really good question because when I was coming out of graduate school in 94 they were just getting Finale up and running. It had been up for a couple of years but it wasn't a real sophisticated program at that time and I remember there were actual there were issues. I, re I remember some people bringing things in but my training had started just we did everything with pencil or we did it with ink and vellum. We actually used to do the hand copying. In fact, I had hand copying class. We had notation classes, you know, with a ruler, try not to smear the ink as you're, you're working. I do use a computer now. I'm a Finale user. I just discovered the other day, I don't know how I didn't notice this. I had, I had, I had a computer die. I had to reinstall my Finale on, a, on another computer, and I turned the box over, and, and my face with my cat was on the, com on the box for Finale, and I, didn't, I don't think I realized this. I bet my cat knew he was there, but I didn't know, so. <laughs> but I'm a Finale user. Uh, Sibelius wasn't around when I was starting, but my process is this. I start with pencil and manuscript. Sometimes I'm just kind of jotting ideas down. I'll have like a notebook or something like that. What I'm normally told is the length of a piece, because I always write on commission, the length of a piece and the instrumentation. And if there's some sort of something they want, like it's an anniversary, or it's a violin concerto, obviously the violinist wants to show off the violinist. Makes sense. But someone always gives me an idea of what the occasion is. I daydream a lot. I try things on the piano. Now, I'm a terrible pianist. I am not good at the piano. But I will try improvising different lines out and figuring out, does this melody sound good? Does it sound like it'll fit the instrument I'm writing for? I'll sketch things in manuscript, and I often will start writing the piece in manuscript. I think I do that because I started out that way. But it doesn't take long for me to move to music notation. If I'm writing an orchestra piece, I will work in a short score. The short score is basically six or eight staves that are there. It's not the full orchestration, but that kind of allows me to get ideas out. And I will enter that into the short score. Now, I don't have my computer to play, set the playback the MIDI, I think Finale and Sebastian have gotten very sophisticated. You can have it play back as if it's an orchestra. I've never done that. I'm not sure why. What I do is I have it go through a, a keyboard that basically sounds like all the lines sound like a piano. It's just what I've gotten used to. Um, but I, I will put it in and try to check. I'll play it back with the idea that it, it's not the way performers do it because there's, a, there's an ebb and flow when a performer's doing anything. It's not a computer will read everything very solidly, like every single note, whether it's a 32nd, a 16th, an 8th, like everything is the downbeat. And a, a good performer won't play everything like it's a downbeat. And so I, I enter things into the computer, and I'll play it back to check the timing, the change in harmonies, and, and things like that. But I also sit back and stare at the page and try to imagine what it sounds like. Now, this is kind of interesting. I, this is something I want to say to anyone who uses Finale or Sibelius, something to watch out for that I've noticed in a lot of scores. I sometimes judge competitions and we'll get 800 scores, believe it or not. Um, that's a lot of scores to go through. But you start seeing patterns where people make the mistake of copying and pasting when they're doing music. And it's frequently in orchestra pieces and it's frequently four notes four sixteenth notes, normally in a scale pattern that just repeats over and over and over. Well, if you get 800 scores and 300 of them do that, you realize there's no originality there. And so those usually get tossed right off the bat. 
So music is interesting if there's variety in it. So the cutting and pasting applications in these programs, while they're convenient, they often foster not interesting music. Because if you've got 300 people doing it out of 800 applicants, it's pretty obvious this person hasn't stopped to think about what they're doing. And so it's something to keep in mind that when you're working on a computer, you want to vary things enough that it stays interesting. But I have to say I'm thankful. I'm actually really immensely thankful for the computer programs because it makes it easy now to add and delete measures. If you do a revision on a piece and you were copying out by hand, Usually you're like, forget it, it's not worth it. <laughs> I'm going to have to recopy the whole thing. Let's see, I'll be four months out of my life sitting there copying. But with the computer, it's fantastic. You can actually just highlight and delete it or add some measures. But the downside of it is people tend to rely too much on the computer and not enough on their imagination. Mm -hmm. And you can always see it when a bunch of scores come in. You know immediately someone who's just said, well, it sounds good on the computer, so therefore it must be good. But we're not really looking for good, we're looking for great. That's what, if you are in a pile of scores that 800, and you want to stand out in that 800, you're going to have to have some original thought, something that sounds distinct. And so the cut and paste can be a little dangerous in that mm, respect. Yeah. There's a rule I always tell my students, I think George Crumb maybe said this to me in a lesson once, the thing that's most important is as you're writing, always ask yourself, is this as interesting as it could be? Can I make this phrase, whatever it is, what this instrument's doing, this movement, this section, can I make it more interesting? So asking yourself that at every point of the writing process has been completely invaluable for me. And I, all the time, I ask myself all the time those questions. Hopefully I answer them correctly. And I, I tell you something, I come up with an idea, it's never interesting on the first go through. I think it's interesting when I start in the morning, I come back the next day, I'm like, ooh, that's not a very interesting idea. <laughs> So then I'm like, well, how can I make it more interesting? Can I do something to the rhythm, move some of the notes around? And so I constantly have to rewrite the phrases to make them more engaging. Otherwise, it just it doesn't work. It would, if I went my first impulse, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, well, you've, uh, you've talked a, a little bit about your, your process. I'm wondering if you'd like to go a little bit deeper than that, or if you'd yeah. be willing to. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, kind of reveal maybe one of your secrets, like maybe something that you have in your little musical toolbox that you think, all right, this little, this kind of gesture would work right here, or this, yeah. this harmonic scheme would work. Can you maybe reveal one of those? Yeah, I know, they're probably not secrets. It's, I often think uh, when you're training as a composer, and this probably works for if you're a performer or something, that you're developing a toolbox. Mm -hmm. You are developing a toolbox. Usually when you start college, your toolbox may have one or two tools in it, not, not a lot. As you study with more people, your toolbox grows. You kind of take different lessons. It's one of the things sometimes I think is good when a student can rotate amongst different teachers because everybody has a different way of tackling the problem of composing. Same for practicing on an instrument. Everyone has a different way of, of handling that. But what you want to do is build your toolbox so you can figure out more and more ways to solve the problem of how do I make this interesting? How is this something that's going to be engaging? I'll give you a, an example. The percussion movement in the concerto for orchestra It's probably a great example. This is, the reason I'm picking this is because it's on a commercial recording. But if you come on Friday at 8 o'clock to the Capitol <laughs> Theater, you'll, you'll get a chance to hear this. It's a fascinating process trying to figure out if you're going to do a percussion movement, how do you do that make it interesting? I realized that audiences don't get to hear the entire percussion section normally. Beethoven and Mozart and those guys, there was almost nothing in terms of how they handled percussion. So I thought it might be interesting to kind of show an array of percussion. I also realized that everyone would assume that the percussion movement would of course be loud because it's drums. That's kind of an automatic assumption. So I will start thinking, well, what's the assumption everyone in the audience is going to make about what it is I'm writing? And then I try to find a way to do the opposite thing. Mm -hmm. So I made the decision early on that the percussion movement should be the quietest point. The beginning of the percussion movement should be the very quietest moment in the entire piece. Mm -hmm. So I thought, as an instrumentalist, how do I make that the quietest moment? So I thought about all the percussion, and I thought, you know what? The effect of bowing percussion instruments, the vibraphone and the crotales. The crotales are a, a metal disc that have a very distinct high pitch uh, that normally is struck. And the vibraphone has the metal bars, which normally is also struck, 
but bowing it, which is not something I came up with. I've seen other composers use it. George Crumb, one of my teachers, who specialized in colors, he made me aware of this. But I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually have all of the percussionists bowing at the beginning of that movement? It, the sound is equivalent to running your finger on a wine glass, a pitched wine glass. Uh, but it's a very magical sound. There's no heart attack or anything. It just, it just kind of emerges. And so I thought, you know what? I should start that movement because you want to tell a story. And I thought, if I'm telling the story of percussion, I should maybe start soft and then allow it to get loud. I should maybe start, because this is an option in percussion, with the pitched instruments and then slowly move to the non-pitched instruments. <clears throat> now I realized there are two kinds of non-pitched instruments in percussion. There are those things which are the small toys, the wood blocks, a brake drum, the cowbell, the tambourine. There's a whole bunch of those little things, but there are also the drums. Those are non-pitched, but they're much bigger sound. So I was determined to use as many different sounds as possible. And I only picked instruments that I thought an orchestra would have in-house so they wouldn't have to rent a lot of instruments. And so I decided to start with the bowing, pitched bowing, and then I thought, you know what, then I could do a little music box thing where I also have the harp and the piano and celesta because those are often considered as percussive because of the way they're struck. I'll have the beginning of this start quietly and because they're going to start bowing, I've got to find a way to get things struck because that's what the next set of instruments would do. So in answer to your question, I'm often thinking about the instruments. What can I do that runs against the expectation of what the instrument can do, but also plays with what you expect it to do? You can actually have both worlds. So I start off with bowed pitched percussion. Eventually they move to striking those. They use light little mallets that they will often hit different things. And the, we have the celesta instead of the piano because it's a great little sound. We're using Mr. Rogers' Celesta. I'm very excited about that. Oh, Fred wow. Rogers' Celesta, very influential in my childhood. So I thought, oh, it's appropriate that that's in here. And the harp also. And then I introduced the wood blocks because I thought they're somewhat pitched, but it's not a distinct pitch. But because they're somewhat pitched, they can kind of mimic what the pitched instruments were doing. So then we have this section that has a, a whole bunch of people playing wood blocks that I often think of, it's like the Woody Woodpecker family reunion sort of thing going on. <laughs> So we have the wood blocks, and then eventually I bring in first a snare drum with the snares off because I wanted to eventually move between all the little toys to the drums. And so people start playing the drums. They're intermixed with the wood blocks, and then everybody moves to the drums. And as the drum section is coming in, kicking in, it starts to grow in volume till you get to the marching band section. So what I do whenever I'm starting anything is I try to think, I sometimes will make a shopping list of, cool sounds I want to hear in this piece. What, what cool sounds do I want to hear coming out of it? One of the sounds I came up with in the percussion movement, we're using piano, but I thought, I don't want to use a regular piano sound. I want an unusual piano sound. So I have the pianist reach inside the piano, put their fingers on the string, just muffle it just a little bit, and then play the piano normally. The sound is so cool, it's very, easy to execute so it doesn't demand a lot from the pianist especially even if you haven't done something like that before with interior piano reaching in and just touching the string and playing it gives you a great color possibility so I'm often looking for unusual colors and I'm sure I got that from George Crumb because his music is loaded with color things but he made me realize that you can look for all kinds of possibilities in when you're composing on any instrument that it can do. If I'm not sure, I'll go to the instrumentalist. I'll stop in a practice room somewhere and I'll say to the violin, hey, can you do this? And what happens if you do this? And so for me, it, it's color and figuring out how to make whatever instrument I'm, I'm writing for the most engaging experience that I can. And believe it or not, sometimes the notes come later. <laughs> Strangely enough, I have to find an interesting musical line and usually I do that a line at a time. Because I'm not a pianist, because I started on flute, I'm a single line instrument player, I tend to hear the music as line against line. My students who are pianists always think harmonically. I, it's a different orientation. But because I played percussion in the marching band, I also think about the rhythm a lot. Hmm. Probably because I was forced to go between the two, I think about colors. Yeah. <laughs> Flute and percussion, totally different. They're totally different. They both have their own sort of demands and needs. So here's a question that you're probably going to hate. Uh -huh. but, um, I don't hate any oh, question. Okay. No. Um, well, this is the one about uh, 
trying to classify your music uh, in terms of you know historical context yeah. or, or style or genre or any of those kinds of words? That's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if any composer is ever qualified to answer yeah, yeah. how to classify one's music. Um, because the truth is, it doesn't matter what language you write in, it's either good music or it's bad music. <laughs> this is really, it's either interesting or not interesting. That's what it all comes down to. So as a composer, you always hope you're in the interesting category, but it's actually not for me to decide that. Sure. I will say that the, it's always my hope that the music communicates, that there's some sort of clear sense of where you are in the piece but that you don't always know the way completely that you find surprises around the corner. It def definitively, I, you would have to say, on a general term, I'm a classical composer. But other than that, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. <laughs> <laughs> but I invite anyone who wants to try, definitely. Yeah. There have been plenty of uh, doctoral students who've done dissertations on my pieces, and it's always interesting to read what they hmm come up with and it's revealing because I often have not planned out things in the piece and they find all kinds of things then I'm like oh wow I didn't know that was in there <laughs> and they'll, they'll say oh of course you planned this out and you did this I'm like oh actually no I didn't uh, it was just uh, I thought it was an interesting sound but I'm glad it works so yeah, <laughs> yeah. it was the intuitive versus the, uh, the structural right planning. we have a lot of debate about that how much do you follow your intuition versus how much do you actually plan it out that's a it's a big question and I actually don't know what the answer is to it I think for everyone who creates anything they have to find their own balance that there's not a definitive answer to that right. I know George Crumb was always talking about he would plan out little elements but instinct was big and he talked about Debussy also discussing instinct I know Debussy was frequently in trouble with teachers for writing things he wasn't supposed to mm. some of the parallel stuff and I noticed when I was writing some parallel stuff, my counterpoint teacher actually came to one of my concerts and I saw him sitting in the audience. This was actually at Carnegie Hall. I was in the balcony and I saw Mr. Aldwell, Ed Aldwell, was sitting down there and I thought, oh no, he's going to hear all those, that parallel motion. And you know, the first thing he said to me was, Jennifer, there was a lot of parallel motion in there. <laughs> he said, did I not teach you anything in counterpoint? I'm like, yes, Mr. Aldwell, you did. I just decided to take a different route. So. That's why you did it. Actually, That's right. That. I was striking out on my own, Mr. Aldwell, right. absolutely. Yeah. But I heard everything you said. So, <laughs> um, Is there anyone else uh, in our audience here who is just dying to ask uh, another question? Anything at all. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to take the microphone? So. Sure. Something that you just said actually um, mm -hmm. made me think of something. I'm a music theory professor, right. and we do a lot of analysis of right. music, of course. Right. And one, student, uh, one question that students very often ask me is, when, you know, when we find something in the music, that yeah. something that you were just mentioning, yeah. like, well, did the composer put it there on purpose? <laughs> and, and so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, uh, you sort of mentioned some yeah. people had looked at your music and found things. But I'm wondering, do you find it? odd uh, when, when people find stuff in your music, or do you find it maybe offensive that they might have found something? That, yeah, that's that, a, it's a good you know, question, you yeah. Can, you know what, I don't find it offensive at all because uh, that a lot of students will ask me, why do I need to take theory? They'll hear me talk and they're like, well, why do I need theory? But the fact is, theory teaches you how music moves. It teaches you how to make motion. And we, I remember when we were studying counterpoint, there are all kinds of counterpoints. 20th century counterpoint, there's Renaissance counterpoint, and there's the counterpoint that Bach did. And the rules are actually a little different, but they all kind of, they share one thing. They teach you how music moves. It's the same thing with harmony. I think a lot of times we, we forget that when we're studying the theory books, because I, I had more trouble in harmony class. It was hysterical. I just, somehow my brain is contrapuntally. I could do counterpoint, harmony I struggled with. But I've, I've had so much theory training that when I sit down to compose, I never stop to think about the theory ever. I figure the training is there. It's like a good performer. You do all the training, but you want to let that go when you're actually creating something because it's the only way to go places you would not have anticipated. And so I don't think about the theory, but it's surprising when it comes up, but it actually does come up. People find all kinds of things. I mean, it's stunning to me how many spots they find where there's some sort of logical progressions there and it may not fit within one particular format of like Mr. Aldwell's harmony class and his uh, he wrote like a book he has an actual theory book and he he was fantastic as a counterpoint teacher and it may not fit Mr. Aldwell's theory but it kind of develops its own world one of the things about composing is you create your own world 
that's the reality. And my rule of thumb now, because of a lesson I had once where someone said, you know, what actually matters is how it sounds in the end. That's what, that should be your, your, I guess your fingerprint. What, and your measurement of does something work, how does it actually sound? And so I thought, well, if that's how I'm gonna judge it from the end, maybe I should start from that point. Let me see if I can write a piece just following my ear and see where that leads me. So surprisingly, by doing that, I've been able to come up with things that I think probably sound more like my music as opposed to someone else's music, but the theory is in there. And that's because I had so much studying of it and struggling through it, because for me, honestly, it was, it was actually a struggle. But I never stopped to think and analyze it, because that gets in the way of my writing. I figured there are lots of people who will take care of that, and I just go on and write the music. But the theory is in there, and I think it's kind of cool that people can find the thing. I'm always amazed when they can find the stuff in there. I, I'm blown away. I'm like, wow, did I really do that? <laughs> and they find things that I'm like, I had no clue about. It's really, I have this piece for two flutes and piano called Running the Edge. And sometimes I'll, I'll make something a little unusual in the title. It's all in small letters, except for the last E is capitalized. The exact opposite of what you expect. You, of course, would capitalize the beginning of each word, running the edge. I made it all small letters and capitalized last because I, I thought this is a very edgy piece. And if I make the last letter capitalized, it'll make people edgy just looking at the title. <laughs> so a theorist took this and looked at it, and they were looking at it. This was probably about six or seven years after I'd written the piece. And they said, do you realize you end on a high E at the end of the piece? And you got that capital E on the end of, uh, of the, your title there. They said, that was planned out, wasn't it? And I was like, is that true? I'm like, what are you looking at? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, it actually fits. I mean, you know, I, who knows what's subconscious? And you can plan things out, but you can also write. And composing, when you get down to the very basic of what composing is, it's taking a sound and combining another sound. It's manipulating the two sounds and making something interesting. So no matter what your tuning system is, no matter where you are in the world, maybe if you're just writing for drums, it's just making something interesting that maybe two people might do, or even the one person. How many different things can you do with a snare drum? Well, there are a lot of pieces for solo snare drum, and people figure out how to make that stuff interesting. It may not be interesting for someone who wants to turn on Lady Gaga, but it would be interesting for all the percussionists out there. Mm -hmm. But is it interesting for you, the person who's writing the music? That's the question, because you're the one who has to sit there and engage in it. And so I often tell my students when they get jammed up, they're like, oh, I can't make this work. I can't figure it out. I'm like, well, what do you think would be interesting to put here? What do you want to hear? And so when I'm composing, I make those shopping lists. The concerto for orchestra, what do I want to hear? I'd like to hear a percussion movement. I want to hear the Philadelphia string sounds. So let's just make an entire movement. So in a way, it's like being a kid in a candy shop and then kind of indulging that. And I let other people analyze it. I let other people decide what's going to work, what's not going to work. And sometimes the pieces don't work. I've had pieces recently. I withdrew a trombone concerto that's existed for, it's been out there in the world for four or five years. And I finally decided several months ago that I don't think it works. So I withdrew it. And yesterday we were actually at a master class and someone raised their hand and said, hey, how, can I get that trombone concerto? And I was like, sorry, no. Because I tried things, but I just, it didn't work. So I, it doesn't matter if you have a Pulitzer Prize or a Grammy. <laughs> Sometimes it just doesn't work, but it's worth trying. That's the thing. You can remember to throw the thing away afterwards. If you don't like it, if it doesn't work, throw it away. Try something else. All right, well, I think we are just about out of time here. Um, I would, of course, uh, well, like to thank a few people uh, for making this webinar possible. Uh, Teresa Gretchen and the West Liberty TV crew uh, for putting in all of the work to do this. Bruce Wheeler and Gail Looney with the Wheeling Symphony uh, for helping to organize this. Uh, and of course, thank to all the people that submitted questions uh, for this as well. And finally, I want to thank you, Jennifer Higdon. Thank you. Uh, for being here. Uh, this has been terrific. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Good job. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.